why men need a challenge and how to do it genuinely is a great episode for you to listen to if you are a nice woman, if you are accommodating, and that is natural to you. I give you tips at the end of this episode so that you can know the energy you need to bring to a situation when you're just meeting a man, either from online or organically, and not only the energy, but actual thoughts you need to have and how you need to approach things with him and for yourself so that you can genuinely be a challenge because that is what a man needs to feel inspired, to feel a bit of fire for you. And in this episode with Jasmine, we go into how she has hurt herself in the past with her past love, Jude, and now in her online dating. So be sure if you are not in the club, go to the end of this episode so that you can find out these tips and start implementing them today so that the nice woman that you are comes across to him in a way that is inspiring for you to get all you desire. I'm so thankful for your advice. I love how intelligent and eloquent you are and still have love and given me some great guidance and direction. And now it's up to me to execute it. I feel a lot better just working through it. I thank you so, so much. I feel like you already are instilling more confidence in me that this is possible. Sick of sacrificing or settling in your romantic life? Welcome to Make Him Wonder with Coach Paula Grooms where women struggling in real relationships ask the expert. Unscripted, unfiltered, understandable coaching conversations to help passionate women succeed in love. Hi there, and welcome to Make Him Wonder. I'm your host, Coach Paula, a dating and relationship coach for women, licensed social worker, and author of the book, Why Won't He Commit? How a Man Decides to Make You the One. I coach you to find a potential Mr. Right, get an ex back, or grow an existing relationship with a man you truly desire, and learn how to inspire his continued interest for the relationship of your dreams, so that you level up to the complete commitment you totally deserve. My guest today is 40-year-old Jasmine, who was recently broken up with 52-year-old Jude. Jasmine finds herself wondering if being in the fun girl category with Jude contributed to what she felt were his toxic behaviors and perhaps even their breakup. Jasmine wants to gain clarity on how to move forward, whether to think about potentially getting back with Jude or to start anew with someone, but ultimately she comes on Make Him Wonder today to speak with me about the best ways to stop repeating her patterns so that better choices come to her readily, steadily, and easily. Welcome, Jasmine. Hi, Coach Paula. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm very happy to be speaking about this today. I know that so many women are going through what you're going through. You're at a stage, I'm guessing from this introduction, of a bit of transformation. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> cool. So this is a good time to be talking. You say you recently broke up with Jude. How recently? So we ended things about four or five months ago. Mm -hmm. And it was actually right in between surgeries I was having. We still spoke a little bit after, but not really as much. The last time we did speak was about a month ago after I had a passing in the family. Um, and now it's just kind of like social media, but I, I don't really interact. He will like my posts, and but we don't really talk now. It's kind of just nothing. Sounds like you've had a lot of things that are high stress level in the past four or five months. Two surgeries, the breakup, a family passing. Uh, yes, absolutely. And even prior to the breakup, I, I think I'm sure may have contributed. He also had a loss in the family and I was with him and, you know, supporting him. His father had passed and his father was sick for month prior to his passing and then and then I had surgery, and then my family member passed. So mm. it, it's been probably about eight, nine months of just so much stress for, on, for both of us. Yeah, absolutely. How long were you together? On and off, a total of almost six years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. 
Wow. Okay. So I want to hear about this then, because six years, for some reason, I felt when you said that you were in the fun girl category and wondered if that contributed, that this was a shorter term relationship or even a situationship or friends with benefits kind of thing. No, it was nothing like that. But after reading your book and listening to some of the podcasts, I, I just kind of thought that I kept myself in that category because there wasn't progression to the next step. It There was still exclusivity. There was still the typical things in a relationship, but it just didn't go you know, further than just dating. I see. I love that point, actually, that you're making because there is in the male mind, I believe, a sense that when we keep staying, we're okaying however he's playing. And he was playing it that, okay, we're not going to make this formal. Right. And, you know, and I think that was the one thing that really stood out to me that made me kind of reevaluate some things. And even some other things that for men, they can stay in a situation no matter how long, you know, as long as you're staying, you know, it doesn't matter what you're saying. But I, I also think part of maybe my challenge is that I never really pushed that right away. Even in the beginning, I didn't start talking about that until maybe almost four years. And prior to that, he would ask me sometimes like, you know, what, you know, what's the end game kind of thing. So when you talk about, you know, the being the GPS, I think sometimes he may have been confused by my own uh, behaviors because I could be so laid back and just okay as long as we are exclusive and respecting each other and enjoying the relationship and then ultimately building to that. But um, I guess maybe I thought it was more of a fun girl because, you know, there was just constant like back and forth a little bit. And so, I, you know, I just kind of felt a little confused sometimes in the experience, I guess. It all makes sense, though, in hindsight. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that now that you have formally broken up, you can see more clearly the nuance of the fun girl, meaning you weren't, I hesitate to use the word pushing, but you weren't making things either formal or were done. Right. So it begs the question about how you broke up? I think it was kind of building. One thing that I would distance myself from in the relationship or where I started putting boundaries was the way that arguments were handled. Sometimes he could be disrespectful or speak in ways that were not okay for me. And I would always reiterate that, but then also, you know, give my distance and make it clear and put in those boundaries and say, you know, I, we're not going to continue to do this if you can't respect this boundary. And I initiated a couple times of, of leaving. And this particular last breakup was after I had my first surgery. And there was still a lot of things going on after the passing of his father. He, ha he had so many things that he had to take care of. But it seemed or it felt to me that whenever he was stressed, I was kind of this like emotional receptacle of that stress. And I initiated the break and pulled away and then I didn't talk to him for a while you know he was checking in with my surgery but I just didn't want to talk and when we finally spoke he was kind of saying that you know he didn't feel that he could handle the responsibility of moving forward and you know making that next step to the commitment and initially for me ending it was more just recognizing those behaviors that I thought were really unhealthy. They made me very uncomfortable and that was really just the biggest issue. And I think part of another reason why I didn't really push so much moving forward with marriage is because there was situations where we were just so kind of toxic. And I, I, I was conflicted with like, do I want to spend my life with someone who is maybe emotionally unavailable or reactive or, or whatever it is, but that makes me feel unsafe at times. And I think when I started listening more to the podcast, I was just curious. I was like, well, is this kind of a behavior because this is just a toxic bad person? Or have I just kind of been this laissez-faire kind of easygoing girl where it's okay that they're not really going to change that behavior? I think it's both. 
That's good to hear. I mean, I think that's what I was really most confused about and just trying to navigate through that. And I had been in therapy for years trying to work through another relationship that after I had left that one, I was um, diagnosed with PTSD and ADHD and all of these things that just really kind of transformed my whole perspective. And I spent years in therapy just trying to heal, recover, or just really understand my own pattern. So in this relationship, I was still a little confused and just trying to navigate through that. And, you know, when I was learning about the Madonna and Fun Girl category, it still stuck in my head. I was like, well, is it because I was falling more in the wrong category that these people were able to treat me that way? Or was I just stuck in that pattern because of the childhood programming? I recognize a lot of those things in my father. And that was kind of, in this relationship, it shifted for me. I was no longer attracted to that. So it's refreshing to hear you say that it's a little bit of both because not really knowing what it is is kind of something that would making me unable to decide if I even wanted to be with that person again or not. Say more about that. When I say it's a bit of both, you're saying that feels better because why? Well, because I think there is a part of me that still, of course, loves and cares about this person. And there is that part of me that is maybe a little hopeful, like, well, maybe there would be something better if it was more of like the fun girl category. Could that change? And could there be a potentially better relationship because of that? Or I guess, is it just this person is not good for you and you need to kind of move on from that? I guess just hearing that you understand that and that maybe this conversation can get us further to helping me figure that out. Yes. And I can give you just my take on this with the bit of information you've given and why I say both. When we start in the just for fun category, and that's really what I need to hear about Mm -hmm. how you started, but Let's just say, for this description, so to speak, that when you start in the just for fun, what the man intuits and knows deep down is that you are lacking in boundaries. And when he knows that, he then feels much freer to be his maybe bad boy self. Does that make sense? It does, yes. So that's why it's a bit of both. Now, would those behaviors of his over a six-year period present themselves? Absolutely. However, if there had been a boundary placed on it very early in terms of making the commitment, that could have also thwarted some of the behaviors, and here's why. You've likely heard me talk about the difference between a committed man and what he'll do and a formally uncommitted man. Typically it is marriage. Because marriage is a huge decision the man must come to, and truly for both sexes, it is probably, save for having children, one of the biggest things that will change your life in a good, bad, or indifferent trajectory. So, Men with most everything, or dare I say everything in their life, it is about what I term the three C's of men. They're about challenge, competition, conquering. So how they present to society and the world in terms of their decision making is huge. This is why marriage is profound, besides the fact that once a man commits to something like his sports team, that's it. You don't go back on your decisions. That's number one. But second is that having made the decision, their male ego in this way is that I'm going to show the world two things. One is I stick to my decisions because that makes me not female. Females change their mind, and they relate from emotion. Men, you make a decision, and you stick with it, and that's it. So, when I marry, I 
in a sense, have to behave in the best way possible so that I don't show the world I fail. I make bad decisions, a la a divorce. This, in what I just said, is much more profound in males. Now, less so than previously because divorce is so rampant, but it still uh, projects onto the world the man's feeling of, I failed in a much bigger way than it does for women, in my experience and belief, because we relate via our emotions. And to us as women, what's the most important thing in the marriage? The most important thing is that it's good, that we have a good relationship, that we get our needs met, that everything is copacetic, emotionally. So when that isn't working, we feel more justified and okay to get out of it and also feel that people will not look askance at us in the same way that men feel that people look askance at them like you are a failure. And this can go to so many little places in the male mind, all the way from I'm just no good at providing, protecting, anything in between, all the way to my dick is too small. <laughs> and like I said, all manner of stuff in between. So in a sense, when we show the boundary from the beginning, the man takes it on in a sense as a bit of a challenge, which is great because we're then playing to one of the three C's of men. And then he will tend to, like in sports, live up to his best potential through that challenge to prove he doesn't fail. Right. That makes that makes perfect sense. And I, I remember hearing you talk about that. And when you bring up again the, the C's, the conquering, the challenge, all of that, what really I think kept me in maybe that category, it's not that I didn't have specific boundaries. I just was fine being just exclusive. I kind of just had a relationship as if we were like friends I because I was also not in the state of mind or even perceiving the relationship as like, okay, I want to get married. I was still a little bit unsure. And this was someone that I had reconnected with because we kind of already knew each other from the past. And when we did start dating, we did talk about being exclusive. There was no messing around. But I tend to just be just very easygoing. I'm not, like, I kind of treated it as friends. Like, we'll go out and I would be fine, like, splitting the bill or, or paying or just making things easy and comfortable because that's just kind of how I liked it. So, But I can see how I, I took away the challenge. I took away the conquering because it was kind of a friendship that you know, an exclusive relationship and dating for so long. I mean, we did everything together, but I understand how how I set the tone just didn't really help either, even though I wasn't quickly sleeping with him or I still just kind of created this atmosphere where there wasn't a need for challenge. It was just kind of all automatically comfortable, even just being available and letting the relationship be a relationship as soon as it was without that having to conquer. I understand and agree that some of it felt like a boundary, but because the male brain is so black and white in this way, it's either on or off, stop or go, yes or no, black or white, male or female. It's for him a sense of the boundary being if you are not going to commit to me, then I'm not all in. I'm not going to keep doing this. And what's interesting is that now it's a sense of, well, you had a commitment. You were together six years and you were exclusive. Right. So we as women think, well, that's a commitment. It's not to the man. Right. And that's the problem. So it doesn't feel like much of a boundary, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And when I talk about the boundary, the, I think the boundaries that I was more focused on was just 
having better conflict resolution and just not being uh, disrespectful or having toxic altercations. That was where my boundaries were. I mean, you mentioned earlier about how as the women, we are focused on like the emotional, the needs of the relationship and how it's cohesive and works well in that aspect. I was more focused on just building a strong relationship and just getting along in a better way because after, you know, as the years went on, like there was just certain things that I just was starting to just really not like. And that was really more of my focus of like, well, if you don't resolve your own emotional stuff, then I am not going to be in this relationship. I wasn't always pushing like, well, we need to get married. And that's the goal. My, my main goal was like having better arguments and recovery. And, you know, over the years, it did get better. In the beginning, I think we were both very toxic. I, I don't want to put all the blame on him. I came out of a situation that was not good and I was still in therapy and dealing with my own thing. So I'm pretty sure I was bringing a, an abundance of toxicity to the situation myself. You know, I, I was also actively changing those things and I was expecting the same of him. And that was kind of really my most priority. I didn't think of marriage so much as the end goal because there were just times where I was like, I don't really know. Do I want to be with this person forever if they can't change, you know, these specific things because they are not okay. They're not healthy. So I do appreciate everything you're saying and I agree with you. I just wanted to clarify what boundaries I was more focused on and, and I kind of neglected to really, I guess, navigate the relationship in a better way by, you know, making that boundary and that expectation of if you want me this is what it needs to be and that's it but I think it's just because I was so uncertain myself of do I want to be with that person these are some little things that are a little scary to me so how did it end and who actually ended it I think it was kind of more mutual because I initiated with ending a, a time that we were together it was right after my surgery and he was just rude to me. The way that he spoke, I, I didn't like. He kind of was raising his voice, and it was something we had talked about before, and it, it almost felt like he was kind of making me just settle for it, like just kind of deal with it, and I was like, absolutely not, and I left, and I told him I didn't want to speak to him, and I needed some time to really think about what I wanted, and I couldn't see a future with us if this is how he's going to handle emotions. And so we didn't talk for a couple of weeks, and he kept checking in because I was supposed to be scheduled for that surgery. And when we did talk, it was kind of a mutual thing of him expressing a remorse, of course, and but also acknowledging that he didn't feel that he could take on the responsibility and kind of left it as, I guess, more of a mutual thing. I mean, a part of me was sad, but a part of me was also very clear about wanting to be with someone who's in a better emotional place. And what has it been since? After that conversation, he would still like text or reach out and I just was not really responsive. We did see each other once after that conversation, maybe two weeks later, or no, I'm sorry, it might have been a month after my surgery, actually. We met once and you know, he was kind of asking to have a friendship and like still kind of see each other. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not friends with my exes, you know, if we're not going to be, you know, together or talking about the future, I don't see the point in us being friends. You know, I don't hang out with my exes. That's just not what I do. And that was, and then he was still kind of texting here and there. And I just didn't really reach out. It just slowly kind of started to fade. And then we called me after the passing of my grandmother and we spoke. And now it's been about over a month since we spoke. And his birthday passed this weekend, but I didn't reach out. A part of me just doesn't see the point. If we're not together, we're not together. So that's kind of how it's been. It's just been random text, but it's it's dwindled. There hasn't been much talk. I was kind of pretty clear about, you know, not really talking. I don't know if that explains it. If that's helpful. It does completely. Thank you. And I'm glad that's the case because I had said in the introduction reading that you are a bit conflicted about this breakup. And one of the initial things we want to be clear about is that there was a definitive breakup whereby you as the woman say what you said, not friends and thereby no contact. 
You did mention social media, however, so what's the deal with that? I know there's the stories on Instagram where people can look what you post and you can see who looks. There was a point, you know, after the breakup, you know, he was still kind of texting randomly or just sending me, you know, memes and things and then I just wouldn't respond. And then I noticed he started looking at my story like all the time and sometimes commenting. And then I kept thinking to myself, I was like, well, he shouldn't have asked to me. So I wanted to block him in that. So he can't see what I'm doing because to me it almost feels like well if you don't want you know the full thing you can't just get bits and pieces where you can just know what's going on in my life to ease your anxiety or whatever I don't know but I just I stopped that because it was also bothering me so I just blocked him to not see my stories but we're still friends on Instagram whatever that is I mean it, there's no real communication it's just I guess just being able to see what's going on that was kind of the one thing I just didn't like him looking at my stories and kind of knowing what's going on. But I also felt like if I did want him back, then, you know, it wouldn't make him wonder if he had access. That's exactly true. So what have you been thinking about getting back? As you said, if I did want him back, what's the conflict? Uh, maybe because I'm, I'm still kind of angry or just hurt about the situation. I feel like when things were really rough with his father, I was very supportive in there. And then, you know, when things kind of got hard for me, he really was not able to do that. And that was the turnoff for me. So there is just a little bit of this, I don't know if I really feel the same way about this person anymore. But there's also that other side where I do really miss him. And I do really miss a lot of the wonderful things about our relationship. And that's just where I get a little conflicted. Because, you know, knowing that Kind of the foundation, how things started, didn't really set it up so great. Maybe there's just a small little hope of like, well, if things were, maybe if there was a change now on my side, of course, because that's all I can control, could that lead into something more beautiful that I've probably always wanted in the relationship? And I did have. I had a lot of beautiful things in the relationship. I don't want to paint it as if it was this terrible thing because I wouldn't have been with him for so long. It's just confusing because I also don't want to have hope for something that maybe just overall was just not supposed to be happening. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Yes, it speaks of the conflict about not knowing whether or not through the change in you, he'll be changed to the degree that would be okay to have a lifelong relationship with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can only know that by making the changes and seeing. This is why it produces the conundrum you're in, the not knowing, but after six years, you can make a very good guess and then manifest from that point, should you say, well, I co-created this relationship because of my XYZ. Or, no, I could be a saint and this man is so damaged. And then two things, lacks insight about his issues and then even if he does have insight lacks the willingness to do anything about it he doesn't give a damn okay um i guess if i were to try to answer that if mm -hmm. i have to, i i don't think it's fair to say that he lacks insight or that he hasn't tried to make his own changes for himself. I know that he was in therapy on his own for other personal things and definitely working, recognizing some of his own patterns. But I don't know if when you mentioned the willingness, like that brings me back to like the category, like if he could have all the insight in the world, but if he has put me in a category, that's not going to be enough motivation to do what needs to be done if I'm perceived in that way. Mm -hmm. But you see, it's through the change you show. There are some really good things about the breakup in terms of showing him your boundaries, like the no contact and the social media. But it would have to go a lot further to actually show the change that will allow him to see you through resetting his perception you will 
be in a new category and largely that's with the boundaries. So it's another way to say it's going to be dependent on you. However, one thing that was lacking is you making the definitive, I am done because of X, Y, Z. Or do you really feel like, no, while I'm saying it's mutual, it was really me saying, this is exactly what I need and would want. And when he said, I can't do that, you just said, okay, then that's it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I was clear about what I wanted. I mean, I did say I was not okay with X, Y, and Z. And if we're not going in that direction, then I don't want this. And I was 100% okay with him saying, you know, I can't take the responsibility. And I was like, and that's fine. Then I can't do this. And that's, that's it. Okay. I was clear about that. And then it was trying to be friends. Well, he was trying to be friends. And I was like, that's not going to be for me at all. And, you know, after that, there was just one or two conversations because of the death. And even then, he was just very, like, wanting to be there, wanting to be supportive. And so... You are going to have to come to that decision at some point. And it does beg the question about what are you looking for Mm -hmm. in your life? Marriage, children... What do you want in your personal life? I do want to be married. And I think this relationship made me realize that listening to you and, you know, reading your book, I think for a while I was maybe subconsciously okay with a lot of things because I was not ready for that level of a commitment. I think I also have the commitment issues. But after listening to you and all the things that you're sharing it and how important it is, I am more open to it now, I'm more aware of, of how much I need that and want that and, you know, kind of going against those subconscious things I was doing of being okay with it not being a, a big commitment. So now I do want that even though it's scary, the idea is very scary to me, but I know how important it is. And I know that I'm already good at being with one person. I don't know why I wouldn't have wanted that or, you know, allowed myself to be in positions where I would maybe choose people that wouldn't lead to that because it was some weird safety in my mind. But I know that I have been exclusive before. It's it's something I'm very comfortable with. But subconsciously for years, even in my previous relationship, I think I've always had this undertone of a fear of that full commitment of marriage. But today after, you know, listening and, you know, learning more of how important it is, especially for a man to bond with you, I do want that. I, I want a partner for my life. I want someone that I can spend my life with. So it is very important to me. As far as children go, it's it's not something I've always been really crazy about, but I don't know if that's because of my relationships. The way that I see children is being deeply in love with someone that you trust, that you know will be a reliable, you know, man and father. So I, I haven't been attracted to the idea of children because I never really had that experience of seeing a man that I was with that I wanted to have a child with. So for me, it's not really a priority. I'm 40. I, I love you know, my lifestyle, I love the things that I do. Having children would not be, you know, a necessity for me. It's not a 100% no. I think that if I was with someone that really wanted to be a father and was an an excellent partner and we had a a great life together and we were able to to provide and and have a life for our children, I would consider it. But um, my biggest priority is having a partner for my life. That's what is the most important and having someone that is, you know, healthy and compatible and, you know, loving and that I can really enjoy my life with. That's what I want. Okay. So it's been, you say, about four or five months. What has your dating relationship life been since then? Because this does kind of play into the getting clarity on Jude and where you go from there. Right. So I did try (laughs) to go on Tinder. I know that was one of the sites you recommended because I know I want to be 
married. I want to have a husband. So I wanted to just kind of put myself out there and just experience what dating someone else could be like. I've only gone on two dates. <laughs> um, nothing really came out of it. But for me, it felt good. It felt like an experience I needed. I don't think that even prior to this relationship, I was with someone for so long, I never really dated. It was, you know, I met somebody and we were together for so long. So the experience as far as dating goes, I mean, I'm, I'm single. I'm, you know, I have an active social life. You know, I do what I want and I'm allowing myself to meet people, to have different conversations, to meet men and just kind of see what else is out there. It's been okay. It, sometimes it makes me miss my old relationship a lot, but it's also still kind of new and, you know, I've only had two people that I've had interactions with. I don't think it's enough to really know for sure. So then it becomes about what you relayed to us for our introduction, the best ways to stop repeating your patterns so that better choices come to you. So I want to get to that and what you think think in a very concise way, because the more concise you can make it and specific, the better for yourself is this. What have been the quote unquote patterns that you have been repeating that you think have brought you to where you are now? And we're going to get to that and we're going to hear your answer when we come back. I trust you're enjoying Make Him Wonder and that you're getting a lot of helpful information for the life of love you desire and deserve. So if you're not part of the 80-20 Wonder Club yet, you need to be, because now Make Him Wonder is exclusive, a members-only club to listen to every episode, past, present, and future, in full, all ad-free. The 80-20 Wonder Club is a Make Him Wonder membership that gives you all of seasons one, two, and three in a categorized list by age and relationship status and a multimedia library of my content, including my book, relationship evals, and my Mechanics of Men Mindset Manual, a weekly action step you can focus on to attract and keep the man of your dreams and have him committing to you completely in the coming months. Make this the moment you start living as an 80-20 Wonder Woman because love, like life, is best lived in 80-20. When you do 80% of what works with men, the 20% you don't won't much matter. Join the 80-20 Wonder Club by going to the 8020wonder.club. Don't miss out. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. You and your man will be glad you did. So while we were on break, 40-year-old Jasmine was considering, pondering what have been her patterns that she believes are patterns, first of all, and why they may be the things or thing holding her back or how they play into her making the choices she has made. So Jasmine, what are your thoughts around those patterns? Maybe just the, the pattern of just being more confident and reassured in myself and not so needing to accommodate others, um, allowing others to come to me, allowing the, allowing the pursuit to actually happen. And I don't mean that I like, I don't like text and, you know, do all of that. Like I do allow some of the pursuit, but not enough. I don't think I, I have made it challenging enough for any, of the guys that I've dated. I've always just gotten along very easily and just I think that that's maybe not a helpful pattern. I think that's something that I tend to do. I tend to almost treat men the same way I treat my girlfriends, which is, I don't think that works. You answered it so, so well. It is a huge issue and pattern that so many of us fall into. And it seems like it could be not only not something negative, but something very seriously positive. That's what it seems like. Like, for example, I bet you hear all the time, how come you're not married? You're so incredible. Like, any man would be so happy to be with you. I've heard that, yes. <laughs> because you have worked on yourself to a degree that you are someone that is easy to relate to. You are, in a sense, good in relationships. Like I bet you have fantastic close friends and 
and maybe great work relationships, meaning you're a high functioning individual that you've got it together publicly and socially. I I don't know about that. (laughs) Maybe I've just been masking this whole time, but (laughs) I don't think I have it that much together, but I do think I do have the capacity to make people feel good. Mm, It's interesting that you said that instead of I have the capacity to regulate myself, I am cognizant of how I treat others within the confines of being reciprocally well. Is that true? That is true. A lot of those things I worked on in therapy and, you know, regulating and just coming to that awareness for myself. But yeah, it is interesting that I would say that I have the capacity to make others feel good. I'm, I'm certain that is, that is my childhood programming being on. <laughs> but I do also recognize that I am more aware and I, you know, I agree with <laughs> what you said. Okay, so we need to stay there with it because that's where the work for you needs to be done. The theme here is that what you have brought up that you recognize as a pattern, making men feel comfortable, being easy in your approach with them. I'm not so sure that that's connoted as the fun girl category, but it could be connoted as the friend girl category in a sense with a little extra. I think so. Uh, And when you mentioned that, it also reminds me, I think in another episode, you had mentioned there is another kind of category that women can fall in almost like familial, like almost like family. Actually, what that is, is there are only three kinds of love. Romantic love, which we all know what that is. Familial love or love for family. And then friendship love, and it's not my concept of the three kinds of love. It's, of course, oldest time, but I actually think there's another kind of love in a sense, like love of nature and beauty, things like that. But that is not under the realm of human or living being love. For example, in the friend, familial combination would be like pets. We don't love them romantically. (laughs) <laughs> They're living things. We don't love them romantically. We love them almost like a family member or friend kind of combination. They're comforting. They're soothing. They're like a friend in that way. They're family member in that they're always with us, etc. So with these three types of love, this is not to be confused with the category. The category of Freud's Madonna whore, whether or not you're in the just for fun or the Madonna category, starts early on in how we present, even online just with our pictures. And if we continue with the actions, behaviors, speech, concurrent with that category. That makes a lot of sense. I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, the more we talk about those categories, I I don't really think I truly present myself as a as a fun girl because I I have expectations even before intimacy and you know like I'm not I don't just sleep on the first date that doesn't happen I'm very particular with those things but when you explained a little bit more about the friend love I can see how being in this relationship as long as I wasn't even the previous one even though that one ended poorly I I could see how the relationship went from being romantic into almost leaning into that friend kind of area and that Mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense when you talk about that I can I think I can relate to that a little bit I really understand now a little bit better for myself that how those relationships this one that just ended and the one in the past how it went from romantic to being pushed more like friend kind of dynamic. And here's what I want to say about the start of it. Was I relate to you in this way in terms of I know from our talk when we first came on a bit before this episode that you are in one of the helping professions. And that's what I mean when I say I relate to this because you have to switch hats when you go to meet a man or on a date with him, or even in the presence of them, because the openness, the understanding that you have human beings and how you relate to them 
generally is not the energy that puts a man in a state of pursuit in the way that will be most beneficial to you. And when someone says to me, I've made it easy for the man, that doesn't necessarily mean sexually. Mm -hmm. But you have the insight to know that you know how to make people comfortable. So this in itself can be an issue because men don't see that under the three C's. And so many times they don't know what to do with it. And it doesn't inspire them in a way that will put you on a pedestal. That makes 100% sense. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate because while in the scheme of things, and for relationships, it is desired by the man eventually. But if we start with it, we do ourselves the disservice. Right. I agree. And I can, you know, just hearing you say that, I definitely can remember times where I have really been in that hat. Another thing I think that also adds to it, because I mentioned earlier getting a diagnosis of ADHD and having autism in my family, I only mention it not, you know, as like an excuse, but I think sometimes even the way of my thinking, my I'm very concrete in a lot of ways and a lot of my relationships that I have, I have few girlfriends, but I get along well with men so easily sometimes and I think I'm pretty sure that alongside with being in this field has kind of made me present a little bit of a confusion to men when it comes to romance. I agree with you 100%. And I think that the ADHD or if you're concerned about anything on the autism spectrum or something like that, I think you can totally put that out of your head because it's not going to matter in this sense at all. In other words, if those two things are true and you have recognized them and are dealing with them, great, because when you're in the relationship, they'll come out, but you have taken ownership of it and you're dealing with it. You know, once I did get that diagnosis, it just made things make more sense. And a lot of my time was just focused on just learning the, the right skills and accommodations to really kind of have that awareness of how I'm going to be perceived by others, what's kind of natural for me. So even, you know, when you talk about the C's again and how I could be still sending across just the wrong messages to not have that proper pursuit. But knowing that is just now an opportunity to do something different. <laughs> yes. The key is in the beginning. Right. And here's how you can understand it. Because like I said, it's such a valuable way of relating to everyone, the skills that you have mm -hmm. and the ease with which someone can relate to you. But when that's there from the beginning, it's an absolute confusion to a man. It doesn't inspire him in the way he needs to be inspired to feel the need to pursue. The reason why the book Why Men Love Bitches has been on the market, republished, I don't know, maybe 20 years into it or something like that, but it's probably been a good 30 years or more that that's been one of the premier books in the relationship space. It's a catchy title. It doesn't mean, and she talks about this, the writer, that you want to be the stereotypical bitch. That is not what it means. It's just a catchy title to sell the book that actually has some good material in it. And the point of it is exactly what we are saying here in a nutshell, that the man having to prove to you that he can act right, do right, be right, is right by you drives his desire, the proving of it in a sense. And I believe this comes from like everything else for us as humans in the human condition from the time of his birth to age seven, being programmed that in order to get your needs met, you must make 
one person above all happy to even survive and you need to get that person to love you and want you and that person is your mother and we have it too as females but typically meaning most of us because most of the population will be heterosexual we as women and even if we are homosexual our identity doesn't have to separate from that love interest and yes she is our first love interest if you want to think about it in that way just like she is with the man but like I said our identity doesn't have to separate but it's how he experiences love is actually going after that love we do too but because it's a woman it's very different in terms of our sexuality mm -hmm. but he needs it to feel what he needs to feel now you've still because of all that you are gotten relationships and the man has loved you and you know that you did and the relationship before and the men you've been with you likely know that they have loved you and likely still do to some degree but it is the lack of that little difference in terms of what he needs to feel the fire and inspired that comes from the beginning right so for you it's very important in how you do that now with men that you meet and I want to get to those particulars for you because if you are doing online there are a few things you're going to want to know right from the initial interactions with him on the app that can help you a lot okay for example I assume you're allowing them to contact you or say you know but if you're on tinder you're just you have to swipe right or left correct correct yeah but okay. I'm only swiping on people who like me I don't like anybody <laughs> okay great and then typically do they contact you or you wait for that contact I, I respond if someone will message me for usually they message first and maybe chat a little bit on there I've asked you know let's have a phone conversation and see if we want to meet I kind of do that pretty you know after we chat a couple times on tinder not to make it like this weird like messaging for days and weeks like I don't have time for that let's just you know let's see if we can have a conversation and if we connect okay so a couple of tips here that's great because you are doing one of the main strategies that I talk about in one love my online dating self-help course because it's very significant that you don't go back and forth showing the man that you're gonna give him a lot of time texting back and forth on the app right yep I remember you saying that <laughs> mm hmm and you want to get to the phone call and the way you get to it is not asking for one it's suggesting one and you may say well that's semantics but not really mm -hmm. because it is stating exactly what you want hey John it's been nice our few interactions here I'm on here to meet people and would love to put a voice to your profile and pictures or profile and photos I'm able to chat now for a few moments to introduce ourselves or tonight after and then you put the time here's my number I'm game if you are mm -hmm. I like that yeah and nine times out of ten the guy will either say something like he can or he can't or he'll text you right away to see you have to remember that many times because men are not necessarily used to women taking this approach and they get all manner of all different kinds of things but they do get trolled on apps by various escort services call chat kind of things etc they do get trolled by that so they can question it a bit when it comes very readily but when you use a uh, high level verbiage it can help yeah that makes that makes perfect sense absolutely so you want to show him right up front I'm not really gonna waste any time any of my valuable time going back and forth and then it goes from there 
once you get that phone call, how you do the phone call in 10 to 50 minutes tops, and how you move it as the woman to a meeting, should you like the way he sounds, the way he's interacting with you, etc. Because before the first meeting, here's what the deal is. Wondering what I'm going to tell Jasmine that she, as the woman, must do to inspire an online prospect to meet? In the rest of this episode, I outline the exact steps every woman must take to make her online dating experience successful. And we also discuss what is needed to begin the process of getting an ex back better to be in a powerful position whereby you make the determination if enough change has occurred with an ex that he is in the position to potentially go the distance. And because I want you to get the results you desire and deserve in your dating life and relationships, I invite you to check out the 8020 Wonder Club, where you can hear the rest of this episode with Jasmine and so much more. The 8020 Wonder Club is an exclusive membership only club of the Make Him Wonder podcast. Most all episodes are unfiltered coaching conversations I have with real women who come to me for my advice on how they can succeed in love. You can hear many of the episodes on the Make Him Wonder playlist on my YouTube channel. But to get all of each episode in its entirety, you'll want to join the 8020 Wonder Club, as that is where nearly 200 ad free episodes are categorized by age and relationship relationship status. And all new episodes are there the moment they're formatted and ready to be aired. The 8020 Wonder Club includes my Making Magic with Men Mindset Manual, a weekly video series of mindset and mechanics practices for you to do at your own pace each and every week. Join the club monthly and cancel at any time or save by committing to a 6 or 12 month membership. And not only will you save by committing to more, you'll receive a full coaching intensive experience where you'll be talking to me personally. You choose the date anytime during your 12 month membership and I'll be answering all your questions on getting what you desire and deserve in your romantic life. Don't miss out on how to make your man wonder in the right way to have the divine right results you want in your relationship or how to start dating in a way that guides a potential Mr. Right to do right by you. Go now to the 8020wonder.club so you can hear all that I tell Jasmine and so much more. That's T-H-E 8020-W-O-N-D-E-R dot C-L-U-B. You and your love will be glad you did.